Outstanding. Well, folks, it's good to have you. Good to be here. Amen. I just thought I'd pass this on to you tonight. God's been good to me today. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes, he has. I want to talk about grace tonight. Grace. And uh, it's a misused word for certain because there are those who take the grace of God and turn it into lasciviousness and allow it to be, it becomes a, a, a license to sin. A person like that doesn't know the grace of God, folks. It's just a word to these people. Um, that song, uh, Jesus Saves, I don't know if any of you ever watched it. I know you sang it here for us last time we met out here, and it was beautiful. If you'll remember, one portion of that says, Oh, to grace, how much a debtor. And we are a debtor to grace. And the grace is, uh, is, a, is a primary doctrine through the Bible. If you have it, turn to Titus chapter number 3 and verse number 4. Titus 3, 4. Titus chapter number 3 and verse 4. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Father, bless this book now, this holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the simple definition of grace is commonly accepted, the unmerited favor of God, to put it in a few words. There's certainly nothing wrong with that, the unmerited favor of God. Uh, it's something that uh, if God's paying you back, then that's not grace. If you've earned it, it's not grace. If God in any sense owes it to you, it's not grace. If it's something that you've accomplished in your lifetime, it's not grace. Grace and gift are synonymous. It has to be given, the grace of God. And this is why the scripture is very important. It's very careful to mention this to you, the grace of God. The first grace that I find in the Bible is when Adam and Eve had sinned and they tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves, fig leaves therefore, becomes a type in the Bible throughout Scripture as man's attempt to cover his nakedness. And the fig tree, of course, is the one that he cursed in the New Testament, the only one that he ever did that, the fig leaf. And he also mentioned the fig tree would be related to the second coming of the Lord because he talked about it being, it would be blooming. So the figs, therefore, that they used to cover themselves, of course, didn't do the job. The only thing that can cover your sin is the blood of Christ. And it takes blood. And when he brought those coats of skins for them, he covered them with it. Now, he covered them with something that was living, that had been alive. So, therefore, it tells me that before they had ever sinned, the creature was in this world that he would use to take the coats from. Think about that. Before they ever sinned, God had already made provision for their sin. Remember this, folks. God Almighty knows every breath of every human that will ever beat, every beat of the heart, everything that's ever going to happen from generation to generation, from the beginning to the end. And he's a just God. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Here yesterday, I think it was, a woman on a, on a transit up in Philadelphia, somewhere in Pennsylvania, was raped. Raped. You saw that on the news. And uh, she wasn't alone walking on a trail somewhere and accosted by some monster. She was on a, on a bus-like thing, that, whatever you call it. And people were watching this and videoing it. They were videoing this while it was happening. Yeah, videoing it. Not a one of them stepped in to do anything about it until uh, on down. I don't know how long this thing happened, but eventually somebody somewhere did something to help this woman. Now, this is what you call jaded, okay? These are jaded people. These are people that live in their own little bubble, and they don't want to be bothered by anybody. It's a sad, sad commentary 
on the whole nation if you even have a handful like that in it. I've told you before that here in Knoxville, Tennessee, the KTL bus, that's what they called it back then, the Knoxville Transit Line, would come down Gay Street and we'd get on. And uh, if a woman got on that bus and there were no seats, a man would get up and let that woman have his seat. How long do you think this Cretan would have lasted in front of men like that? Think about it. One of those men would have taken him down. But you see, the fact that he had the gall to do it. Obviously, apparently, he thought nobody's going to intervene. And he did it in public right before the people on board that thing. Somebody needs to take the temperature of America and say, folks, you're sick. And you need help. America needs help. And, of course, if you don't know what a Cretan is, read the first chapter of Titus, and you'll find out what a Cretan is, and you'll understand what the Bible says about them. Sad, sad, sad thing indeed. Now, in the Old Testament, God called Abram from Ur of the Chaldees, and he called him and gave him a promise of a land, go into the land that I will show thee. And then he told him he'd make of him a great nation. He said he'd be the father of nations. He changed his name from Abram to Abraham. He added the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet to his name. And he changed it from Abram, father, to Abraham, high father. Abraham, therefore, became the spiritual leader of his household. God said of Abraham, I know him. <laughs> he said, I know him. And he'll lead his family right. He'll teach them and lead them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. So therefore, Abraham became the spiritual priest in that home. He, he, he exercised the office of priesthood in the home. This was 1,900 years before Christ. This was long before Moses. 500 years before Moses ever showed up, we have Abraham believed God. And because he believed him, it was accounted to him for righteousness. The grace of God brought down to Abraham all these blessings. And Abraham walked with God. He walked before him. God said, Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect. I am El Shaddai, almighty God. He revealed himself to Abraham in many, many different ways, as much as Abraham probably could understand it and accept it. So long before the law was ever given, long before any of that, Abraham was a priest and he was a priest in his home, and he was leading his home right. Followed him was Isaac, then Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons. And from Jacob's 12 sons comes the 12 tribes of Israel. Therefore, a nation is born. The 12 tribes that make up, uh, as to this day, the 12 tribes of Israel. And they were born. They, they, became, they, they were the descendants of Abraham. And they were carried off into... Egyptian captivity. Joseph was sold as a slave. And he was sold as a slave. And 400 years later, God sent Moses to deliver them from Egyptian bondage. 400 years. God told him, Genesis 15, he said, in the fourth generation, I will deliver them. And he did. He delivered them. All that time, these men were growing up in a pagan, godless place. That's all I can say for Egypt. The gods of Egypt, God said, I'm going to judge them on that first Passover. The, the, uh, the uh, death angel moved through Egypt. And all he was looking for was blood over the doorpost and over the lintel. That's all he looked for was blood. And he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And our songbook is full of songs about the blood. And the blood, of course, cannot be crossed. That line cannot be breached by Satan or any demon in hell. It is the blood of Christ that seals us and redeems us. So with an outstretched arm, he said, I will bring you out. And he did. And he said, I'm going to judge the gods of Egypt in doing that. And he did. He called him out into the wilderness. And Aaron was Moses' brother. And when he was in that wilderness, God began to reveal to them something that they had never known before. It was all new. 
and from Sinai he thundered down the law. Moses was at the top of that mountain for 40 days, and God, with the finger of God, wrote into the stone the Ten Commandments, and they came down from that mountain. And the people, of course, were worshiping, a, worshiping Apis, essentially is what it was, Apis the bull, uh, one of the Egyptian gods. And Aaron had fallen for it, and Aaron had, uh, had succumbed to it and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, that brought us out of Egypt to satisfy the people, but that never satisfies people. The only thing that can satisfy you is the Lord. But you see, the priesthood of the home had been gone by now. It was taken away from them. And there was nothing wrong with it. Abraham walked with God all the days of his life, served the Lord. He didn't need the law. The law was written in his heart. Jeremiah the prophet prophesied and said, there's going to come a time when the law will no longer be written in stone, but I'm going to write it in your heart. Well, the heart has to be prepared for that and it has to be receptive to it. But it also shows the power written in the heart, the law of God. That's over in the book of Jeremiah, then quoted again in Hebrews chapter number 8. Written not in stone, where you can only read it. Written in the heart, where you know it. You know it from the soul. So he will write that in their heart, and he will write in their heart in the, uh, in the millennium. Israel will rise again above all the nations of the earth. And then in the thousand-year period of time, they'll become the head of all the nations, and the law of God will be written in their heart. So it'll no longer be do or die. It'll be believe and live, and that's exactly what they'll do. It's going to be a wonderful thing. It'll be a wonderful thing, folks, for Christians to watch God with the Jews when they look upon him whom they have pierced and they mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son. You have never heard mourning in your life like you will hear that day when finally Israel is, uh, comes face to face with their Messiah. And they will come face to face with him. Make no mistake about that. So this law was given, it was added, the Bible says. The law was added because of their transgressions. You see, God in the beginning didn't give them the law. And the only thing he said to Adam, he said, don't eat of this tree. That was it. <coughs> no law. Just don't eat of this tree. Don't disobey me. But the law was added. Namas is the word for it. The law. And it was given to convict them and to show them their sinfulness. And it started at Sinai when they took Apis the bull and made him their God. And God would not stand for it for a moment. Thousands died because of that. But Moses came down from that mountain with a law. And the finger of God wrote that law and he gave it to the lawgiver. So... Look at Romans chapter number 11. And I'm going to read John 1, 17 for you. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I wonder why they combine the words grace and truth. Is not the law true? But you see, the Bible says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Is the law spiritual? Yes, it is. Is the law holy? Yes, it is. Is the law a declaration of the righteousness of God? Yes, it is. But the law cannot give you righteousness. And the law cannot make you holy. The law can't do anything for you. It is only given for you to see what you are. And you have to look to God for him to do something for you that can only be done by grace. So by the keeping of the law, the Bible said no flesh should be justified. The Bible said in Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 6, If by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. You see, under the law, God demanded righteousness from men, and they could never produce it. So under grace, God gives men righteousness. He does. Note carefully. Before the law was ever given, the word righteous shows up with Abraham. The Bible says that Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him. 
imputed to him, put on his account. Here's Abraham's name next to it, righteous. And the righteousness is not what Abraham worked for or accrued or was given because he deserved it. The righteousness that God gave him, he gave it to him out of grace. In plain words, Abraham was following the light he had, living the life he could live, doing what he could do, but he was never a perfect man. You don't believe Abraham was perfect, do you? Of course not. No man that's ever walked this earth with perfect but one. But God was gracious with him. In the book of Romans, chapter number 3, in verse 21, it says, The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See that? <laughs> Do you know when God raised up the prophets? You go check it out throughout the Old Testament, and you'll find out that God raised up the prophets when the law, the teaching of the law, had failed by those who taught it. And who was responsible to teach it? The priest. The minor prophets, as they call them, excoriates the priesthood for failing to do their job. And it says that you were falling over the tables and vomiting because you were so drunk. You failed to do your job. You failed to teach the people and instruct them in the law. You remember what happened over there when they came back and rebuilt the temple, don't you? And rebuilt the walls. You remember who one of them got up and he expounded the scripture for them. He read the word of God. He told them and explained to them what the Bible meant. And he was teaching them the scriptures. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It is. Because the Ethiopian eunuch, when he was reading the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, Philip said, understandest thou what thou readest? And the eunuch said, how can I? Except some man help me and show me. Well, to us, that seems so simple, doesn't it? So simple. But remember this. When Philip said that to the Ethiopian unit, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Acts, the Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, all the New Testament books did not exist. They didn't exist. The only thing that existed at that time was the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the pseudepigraphic writings, and the Apocrypha. And that's it. No New Testament books whatsoever. And so do you understand what you read? He said, how can I? And so at that place, the Bible says he began to preach Jesus unto him. He preached Jesus to him from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, the prophet. See that? And he went right to the point, too. He didn't hem haw around with a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, 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 dispensations, and I'm, all, I'm a dispensationalist and all that, but he went straight to the point. And he preached Christ to him. Why did he do that? Because that's the only one that can save you. That's the only one. So under grace, God gives you freely what could never be given in the Old Testament to those under the law. If they trusted the law to become their righteousness. If they thought that by keeping the law that that would get them to heaven or it would become righteousness in the sight of God, it never worked. Not a one. Not a single one. For the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Can't do it. So year after year after year after year, they just pushed it forward. And then in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, when Peter got up and preached on the day of Pentecost, he preached about the redemption of the sins, for the redemption. Be baptized for the redemption of the sins. The sins not only of what you've committed, but the sins of the past. The Lord Jesus Christ paid for all of the sins, past, present, and future. There can only be one sacrifice for sins. There can't be many. And it was all done by grace, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. What's the word justified mean? Justified means that God has simply passed a judicial decree that you are guilty of your sins, but you are not, you're, you're guiltless as far as having to pay for that sin. You're guiltless. You've been justified. God has, and the justification never comes by what you do. The justification comes by faith 
in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. It doesn't make any difference what it is. All the words in the Bible, everything that has to do with salvation, every, every nuance of it, everything, it all comes back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing can be accomplished with God that relates to your soul outside the Lord Jesus Christ. He's everything. He's everything. He's either everything or he's no thing. You see what I mean? He's everything or he's nothing. And, of course, this is what the Bible says. The law is with Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And as I said to you before, why was the law given? The law was added because of transgressions. Note carefully, added, added. In plain words, God would have a relationship with these people, but it had to be added because they were stubborn and rebellious. And so therefore, 1,400 years before Christ, 500 years after Abraham had, was walking before God and, and his faith was imputed to him for righteousness, 500 years later, Moses writes a book and he gives them the law. And the purpose of that law was to bring them guilty before God. The Apostle Paul argues that in the book of Romans time and again. He said, when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. It was the knowledge of the law. By the knowledge of the law, you shall be, it'll condemn you. It'll condemn you. There'll be no salvation whatsoever. So what do you do tonight? I mean, I want you to look at the book of Romans with me. Romans chapter number uh, 14. And verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubt disputations. In plainer words, be patient with newborn Christians. Be patient with them. Be patient with them. Don't get up and just blast them and, you know, give them time to learn some things and to grow in the Lord. Verse 2, for one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. See that? Here we are, weak Christians. Didn't say they weren't Christians, said they were weak. Verse 3, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. In plain words, are you a mature Christian? Well, don't run it down the throat of that one that is a babe in Christ. Encourage the babe in Christ. Pray for the babe in Christ. Lead the babe in Christ. And expect the babe in Christ to make the same mistakes you made. I made a bunch of them. Anybody here make any mistakes after you got saved? Plenty of them. And I'm not proud of them either. Verse 3, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Now watch him as he gets into this. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? You see, God's the only righteous judge. He's the only one that can pass out real judgment. If a, if, if, if a, if a baby in Christ may get away with something you can't get away with, a lot of people, they have a problem with that. Well, all sin is sin. And sure it is. But the thing is, for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I am held accountable, folks, for a whole lot more now than I was 10 minutes after I got saved. A whole lot more. God won't let me get away. No way, because I know better. Now look at verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. See this? I mean, I don't know how to make it any plainer. He may be weak. He may be vacillating. He may he not be able to stand on what you can stand on, but God will still have a special grace, cross, him up, cross the line, and bear him up to get him through. The times when his faith is truly tested and he's not ready for it. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if the Christian life was, was the way you felt five minutes after you got saved for the rest of your life? Hallelujah. <laughs> wouldn't it be? I mean, tell you right now, I was, I was on top of the mountain. Believe me. And I'm sure you were too. Wouldn't it be wonderful if for the rest of your life that you could be up there on top of that mountain? Amen. And I bless their hearts. Some people think they can stay up on top of that mountain. 
And boy, when they hit the bottom, it's not going to be good because you will come short. Now look at verse number five. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. What's that mean? Look at verse 6. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not and giveth God thanks. See this? See this? One knows better but he still gives God thanks. The other one doesn't know and goes ahead and still gives God thanks. See this? And so one man esteems one day above another. Every man esteems every day. Some men esteem every day alike. Now you have a, you have a rest tonight. Shabbat means rest. Okay? It means rest. That's what the seventh day was. On the seventh day, God rested. He did not rest because he was tired. He ceased creation. What had he made the sixth day? We showed up. <laughs> That's when he made man. And man was the crowning achievement of God's creation. And he saved the best for last. Well, you mean tell me that, that I'm better than my dog? Yeah, you are. You sure are. A whole lot better than your dog or your cat or squirrel or rat or whatever. You are, you are infinitely better than any animal on this earth because you're not an animal. You're a man created in the image of God. Amen. Amen. Now, there are people who firmly believe that Sunday is the Sabbath. All right, so what do you do with that? Well, let them believe it. Pray for them, embrace them, and say, God bless you. Amen. There are those who do not believe that Sunday is the Sabbath because they don't need a Sabbath day. They have a Sabbath person. When Christ went to the cross, he finished the work. And he, the writer of Hebrews talks about that finished, that rest, to enter into his rest. But there again, I'm not going to try to persuade you one way or another. You see, I'm just simply teaching in broad terms for you tonight to understand that there are people out there that will send you to hell if you don't keep the Sabbath day. They will. They'll send you to the pit. And here's, let me say this about legalism. And I want to be as honest as I know how and candid. Legalism will consume you one day. Yes, it will. They'll turn on you. And when they turn on you, they're thinking they're doing God's service. They think they're serving the Lord. They will turn on you and consume you. But the Bible says, let that man that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Considering thyself also. What's that? If you think you're standing, you think you're standing, you're a baby. You're a baby. You know, you have to know he's upholding you. The grace of God is holding you up. That's not yourself. You can't do it. So let that man that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So you see a brother fall. I read a thing today that had 35 or 40 preachers. 35 or 40. I don't forget how many it was. And then a whole lot more that had fallen. And just recently... And some of them were big names, and many of them you'd know, and some of them you probably already know. So what does that do for me, and what does it do for you when you see something like that happen? Well, let me tell you what it does. It should not puff you up. It should not make you feel good about yourself because you didn't fall. So what should it do? It ought to sadden your heart. It ought to sadden your heart, and you ought to say to yourself, you know, in a lot of ways, that man right there is much better than I am. If he fell, I can fall. This is what he says. Let that man that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. And so, you know, that attitude will allow the grace of God to work in your life. 
God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you cannot understand your weaknesses and the fact that you will never meet the righteousness of God, it's got to be given to you. And the righteousness of God is not a thing, it's a person. <laughs> In the Old Testament, God counted it, imputed it, okay, to Abraham, but not now. For he says in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians 1, he is made unto us righteousness. He who? The Lord Jesus Christ, the only righteous one. And he's righteous, believe me. The righteous one. So, you know, I'm not righteous. I don't go out expecting to do something, but I do fail. I don't take any joy in it. And I do not take any joy in watching some preacher uh, go belly up, go down, fall. First thing I think about is his family. He's got a wife. He's got children. And it's awful sometimes you think what those children are going through. Right now there's a case, and I won't get too specific with it, but there's a man that's been accused of child pornography. He's facing 20 years in prison. Each count. And not how many counts there are against him. And the whole family has been brought into complete disarray. And I have prayed and prayed and prayed for that family. I continue to pray for them. It's awful what they're going through. You, I hope you don't take joy in something like that. You should be praying. You should be pouring your heart out to God. People come to the church. They come to the altar and they pray down here. You don't know what's in their heart. And you don't know how much they understand. Sometimes people pray, and we're all guilty of this, our prayers are only, a, are only like a Band-Aid. That's the way to put it. You know, you, you, you pray about the obvious, and you pray about that, and that's all good, but you don't get to the heart of it. What really caused you to do what you did? I do not believe for a minute that any preacher or anybody in the church just all of a sudden falls. I believe it's a process. I believe it's a process. It takes time. You start losing here, losing here, giving into this, accepting something that you know you wouldn't have accepted 10 years ago, and you've drifted. And the first thing you know, you get shocked into reality to find out how far you've drifted. So what do you do? Well, God will give you a Christian. He'll give you a brother or a sister that knows and they understand maybe they've even been there and they'll help you if you're in a church where all they can do is condemn you and kick you out the door they did you a favor they did you a favor find a church where you've got christians who have real love they're not they're not condoning anything you did but they want to restore you in the fear and the admonition of the lord they want to restore you because their heart's right. They want to restore you. I swear, man, I'm telling you the truth tonight. I get so tired of watching young people die, drug addicts, throw their life away. Don't you? Doesn't that bother you? Whew. I'll tell you the truth. It just, you know, it. it uh, America's got its good stuff and it's got its bad stuff. As somebody said, you eat the chicken and spit out the bones. <laughs> That's a way to put that's one way to look at it. I mean, it has America has got a lot of good things about it. But it's also got some garbage. You know this book is perfect, isn't it? If you're looking to find fault in somebody, you won't have to look long. You won't have to look long. You'll find it. And if you want to find the one with the most fault, just look in the mirror. A real, a real fellowship with God is the man or the woman who sees, and they're mature, and they understand, and they know that Satan is sifting one, sifting them. And instead of helping condemn them, kick them down, ostracize them, and so forth, you start praying for them. You start praying. And ask God, what can I do to help them? What, what can I contribute to that life that's being smothered out? And that's a, that's a wonderful thing because it takes some maturity to do that. It really does. It takes, it takes some patience and maturity to do it. I've seen some stuff happen down through the years. It just blows my mind how people treat each other. How they treat each other. 
in church. <laughs> when I talk like I do tonight, the legalist says, yeah, he's up there condoning sin. And I'm not condoning anything. Well, let me tell you something, legalist. You're liable to fall, son. Don't think for one minute that you can make it out of this world on your own. You can't do it. And when you fall, you're going to bounce hard. And you're going to want somebody that will come and bear you up. And it won't be another legalist. It will be somebody that knows the grace of God. Amen. Amen. I could help pastors, especially those starting out in the ministry. I could help them because I know what to say to them. I could tell them what to expect. I could tell them right off the bat, you didn't get an easy job. You got something that will try your soul, but it is the most blessed thing you could do if God's called you to do it, and you'll never be satisfied unless you're doing what God's called you to do. I'd say that to him. The fellow up in Johnson City, he wrote a book, and he said, Preacher, please quit. I thought to myself, what about that? Preacher, please quit. Well, preacher, don't you think it's, it's awful to tell a man to, to stop and get out of the ministry? No, he needs to go. There are people that disagree with me. They think that just because... You have, uh, you know, somebody coerced you or daddy was a preacher or whatever. You could, Just anybody can get up and open the Bible and preach. You're dead wrong. It has to be a call. Now, you can get up in the Bible and speak. You can get up in the Bible and, and be an inspiration and even exhort people. That's good. You ought to do it. But you see, the call of God will get you through the hard times. Because there will be times you say to yourself, why am I doing this? Why do I keep? I can make a living another way. Good night, man. Why am, I, why am I here? Why am I staying at this? It's because somebody and that Old Testament said, his word was in my heart as a burning fire. He said, I'll not speak again in his name. I'm done with it. I'm finished with it. Who was it said that? That's right. <laughs> he just thought he could quit, didn't he? Yeah, he thought he could. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time I have together with my brothers and sisters tonight. Father, I pray of all things, the most thing is for them to love each other. Heavenly Father, and to come to each other's aid when they need somebody from God to bear one another up. Heavenly Father, not to condone any sin, make light of it, make excuses for it. No, no, no. But to come with the only remedy there is for sin, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And to learn how to preach him and teach him and minister and pour in the oil and the wine. Somebody needed what I said tonight, Lord, either in this house or over the Internet or wherever or later. And whoever you are, I don't have to know who you are, but why don't you bow right now and remember this. Christ tasted your death, and he knows where you're headed, and he came to break the power of the devil in his own ground, in his own home, face to face. And he did. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, well.